Well, we're in Mark. Um, let me just read verses 10 through 21 and we can uh, jump in. So verse 10, then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. They're prepared for us. They're prepared for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and said to him, one after the other, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, as we look at these truths, we pray that uh, your Son would be glorified. We'd be able to uh, see the purpose of how Mark put this together for our benefit through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and it would speak to our hearts. And we would, we would see your hand at work, even in these uh, difficult times for your Son, but also glorious times for the disciples and your Son. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. So we began looking at verses 1 through 16 last week. Uh, we saw how there are four historical scenes, or at least I saw four historical scenes that Mark sets up for us. Um, we looked at the meeting of the chief priests, the four things, the meeting of the chief priests and the scribes in verses 1 and 2. Then there was dinner at Simon's, uh, which is verses 3 through 9, um, or Simon the lepers. Uh, then the meeting of Judas and the chief priests, then the preparation for the Lord's Supper. Um, and the way Mark lays this out, um, uh, up to the Last Supper, we'd call it the Last Supper, but really it was the Passover. It was a Passover meal. Um, and these events we saw were not sequential. So when you see verses 1 and 2, that probably happened Wednesday, Thursday. Um, verse 3 through 9 happened on Saturday, we know by looking back at Matthew. Um, and then verse 10 probably happened after the meal. Um, both Matthew um, and Luke and Mark say, tell the story of the meal, and then say, then Judas went to betray Jesus to the chief priest. So if, if you believe that the then, and I don't see any reason to say that it wasn't right after the meal, that means that Judas was looking to betray Jesus from on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and, and, and here on Thursday when they're setting up the Passover meal, he was looking for an opportune time to betray Jesus. It really added a new dimension to the whole, um, this Passion Week. Um, and Matthew says that that time, like right after the meal, and remember at the meal we looked at this last week, that's where Mary broke the, the, the bottle of perfume. Remember we thought it was probably, it says pure perfume, so it probably was that, what, 20 to 40% mix that we talked about. Very, very expensive, even in our day and age. It'd be the equivalent of a $75,000 bottle of perfume. <laughs> That's the equivalent of what she broke, because it was a, a 300 denarii was a year's wages, because the denarii was a day's wage. You take our the average income here in Washington, that's about $75,000. That was a very expensive uh, a bottle of perfume. And uh, remember, there was an objection. The objection was, well, you should have sold this. What a waste, right? And one of the Gospels says that he wasn't looking to give to the poor. He was looking to help himself to the money because he, he was a thief. Um, but anyway, um, when he went to see the, uh, after that, he went to the chief priest. And um, we see in verses 1 and 2, um, and I know it's not sequential, but this is how Mark laid it out. And I think there's a reason why Mark laid it out this way. He's basically building up to the Last Supper, we would call it, and uh, the, the cross. So he's showing, and I believe you see here, um, he's trying to show God's providential control over everything because he very specifically gives the motives for at least two of the groups. Um, and we can surmise the, uh, the third being would be Satan. We see from Matthew, you can surmise what his motive is. So you have three, uh, three motives here. And all the motives don't get fulfilled. It's God's motive that actually gets fulfilled. So 
like Esther, where you read Esther, God isn't mentioned, but you see God in control of everything. Uh, he's working everything out. Uh, we would say coincidence, but um, I would say providentially working for the good of his people. And you see that here in this story, verses 1 through, um, really 1 through 21. Judas must have done a pretty good job fooling the other disciples because they all said, is it I? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a very, um, he was a very skilled hypocrite. Um, but he did not fool Jesus. Jesus said multiple times, one of you is a devil, I believe is, 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 was the word, the phrase, I, I chose one of you, I chose you. Um, which really, if you put the end and the beginning together, Jesus chose Judas for this purpose. I mean, think about that. But, but, but also think about in the life of Judas and the ministry of Jesus, as Judas was following him, he preached, he healed, <coughs> cast out demons, because if he didn't, he would stand out against all the other apostles who did. Um, so it's just something to think about, you know, that um, it's, it's, it happens in our day as well. We have this idea, and I think it's comforting for us to think this way, that we could spot evil, that we can see somebody who's evil, that we know when somebody's doing bad. Well, how do you know that? Well, because I've seen the movies, right? And what are, the, what are all the bad people look like in the movies? Greasy hair, awkward, very annoying, usually dressed in all black, right? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. They're just, it's obvious They're, that that's the evil and this is the good. I mean, it goes all the way back to the beginning before there was even a, a voice and, and sound in movies. What, what were there? There was two kinds of hats. Do you remember? The good guys wore white the white hats and the bad, guy, bad guys wore. That's how you knew this was good and this was bad. And, uh, and I think we like to think that we can spot evil. Um, and I think some of that comes from our, what to use a Jewish word, our chutzpah. <laughs> we like, why well, can tell? You might not be able to tell, but I'm smart enough to tell. But um, this just goes to show you that, I mean, they didn't know he was stealing. They didn't know he was going to betray. They had no idea what was in his heart. But on the outside, it looked like it's any other disciple. And I think that's a good reminder when people that we know, and, and I'm sure we're, all of us are far enough advanced in our Christian walk that you've probably had people that fooled you too, you know, and you look back and it's heartbreaking to think of how they've left the faith and they've gone and you're like, well, I didn't know that. I never would have thought that. <laughs> right. Um, and it's the same thing with the disciples. Just, and when he said, one of you is going to betray me here at, at the, at the last supper um, to invite somebody who is an enemy of yours and to betray that person was very, very socially unacceptable and shocking. It says they were described as very sorrowful, deep, deep sorrow. Um, and they began, well, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? They, they didn't know. Um, so, yeah, definitely a very deceitful a hypocrite. But all hypocrites are deceitful. Some are more skilled than others. Uh, but anyway, the, the plot, and I notice the plot in verses 1 and 2, their plan was really simple. Um, one was not during the feast. And remember, the feast lasts for seven days. Um, so they didn't want to arrest or kill Jesus during that time. And they wanted to quietly arrest him and kill him. Um, and they gives a motive of why. They said, well, because we don't want the crowd to get involved. They, and I believe Satan, drastically misunder, uh, um, I, did not, did not um, have an understanding of what the crowd would do very well. Uh, I believe Satan and the chief priests and Judas, well, Judas doesn't really say that, but the chief priests and Satan both believe the crowd would do something that they did not do. <laughs> They underestimated how the crowd, crowd would respond. Um, then Mark describes the dinner we saw, strong objection from Judas. Um, Jesus clearly said what Mary did was good. It was a public rebuke to what Judas said. Um, it doesn't say it here in Mark, back in Matthew. I think it's in Matthew and Luke. It says that Judas was the one that objected. What a waste, right? Jesus clearly said, no, this is good. What she has done is beautiful is what he says. And not only is it beautiful, but this will be taught wherever the gospel is taught until basically till the, till, as long as the gospel is taught. So this entire age, so far 2,000 years, right? That this woman, what she did, what Mary did for me is going to be known. And here is Judas saying, well, I want to give it to the poor. Jesus knew his heart. It was a public rebuke. Um, and so this happened on Saturday evening. So I'm guessing maybe Sunday is when he went to the chief priest. Sunday to us is the Lord's Day. But their Lord's Day was Saturday, so Sunday was their first day of the week. It would be like our Monday. And so he went to speak to the, uh, the chief priest, which it says more than happy to oblige him and be willing to let him uh, uh, betray Jesus. 
Um, both Matthew and Mark tell us, then Judas went to the high priest. So the dinner, then this happened, probably right after. Um, this would place this interaction around Sunday. Um, so let's look at the preparation. That brings us to this preparation. So we had the meeting of the chief priests, the dinner at Simon the Lepers we looked at last week, and the meeting of Judas and the chief priests, which we looked at a little bit last week. The last one was preparation for the Lord's Supper, and that takes us right into what we call the Lord's Supper. Jesus sends two disciples. Um, Luke tells us it was Peter and John. So Peter and John were sent in to go where they will eat their Passover meal together. Um, Judas was listening. He was, he was listening to where they were going to be because, remember, it said he was looking for an opportune time to betray Jesus. When did he want to betray Jesus? I think Matthew tells us where there were no crowds. Um, what is left out is to arrest him silently and kill him silently. He just wanted to betray Jesus when there was no crowd and then move on. So he didn't mirror up with what the chief priest wanted to do. He just wanted to do it where there's no crowd. He wanted to get his money and move on, you know, cut his losses, so to speak. Um, by the time Judas figured things out of where they were going to eat their Passover meal, which would be the perfect place to betray Jesus, is to go and say, hey, by the way, we're going to have a Passover meal here. They would show up, arrest Jesus. Everybody would be eating their own Passover meal. It would be real quiet because in the evening, Passover meal starts about 6 p.m. when the sun sets and would go many times till midnight. It was a very long meal, and everybody would be in celebrating, kind of like if you drive around on Christmas Day, <laughs> there's no cars out. Yeah. Perfect time, but Judas is thinking, but he didn't know where it was. And I think that's why Jesus did this, what I call cloak and dagger. Go see this man carrying the water, which by the way is a very strange thing because men don't carry water, right? But here's this man, so it'd be easy to spot. Oh, oh, there's a man carrying water. It's not like here's 30 men carrying water, right? It's only there's this one. And uh, they were supposed to follow him to the house, speak to the master, almost on this code saying, my master desires this room. They have the room. And, and you wonder, what in the world is going on here? I believe it's to keep uh, Jesus at, and I'll talk about why this is important. Jesus needed uninterrupted time with his disciples before the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was sold. And then, and plus, he had a very strict timeline. He wanted to, I mean, he had to die on the 14th of Nisan at 3 p.m. on that day. Um, so all of world history is working towards the 14th of Nisan, 3 p.m., uh, right when the, the, the uh, sacrificial lambs or the, the Passover lambs would be being sacrificed, uh, literally millions of them being sacrificed in the temple <laughs> at the time. And that's when Jesus was on the cross dying. Um, and the, uh, the leaders didn't want that. Uh, Satan didn't want it. I'm going to make the case for that here in a second. But yet yeah, God worked it out so it happened just when he wanted it to happen. And so this, this, the timing is very important. Um, so by the time they got there, Judas was in with the meal and he couldn't break away without being obvious, right? And Jesus excused him on his own timing. So it's just beautiful how God is in control, Jesus is in control. He worked this all out. Um, so the meal, um, you notice that Peter and John prepared the meal. We don't, we don't know whether that, that man had a lamb there. Um, one interesting note, um, and I was looking over on, his, uh, on the, the bookshelf here, and they have a, a history of Josephus. You see it up there on the top right, Josephus? Mm -hmm. that, that's the historian that lived during Jesus' time, and he, uh, um, he recorded a lot of this stuff, trying to explain to the Romans. He was a Jewish person himself. He was trying to explain to the Romans what the, what, what, what the motivations for the Jews were. And he mentioned that when Passover meal, and we know this too from the Mishnah and other things that the Jews wrote, that a Passover meal was to be celebrated with a group of people between 10 and 20. Um, if, it was, if it was less than 10, you need to get more people to have the meal together with because you had to have at least 10. Um, and I believe that, that is found in Exodus as well. That would be at least 10 people. Um, but it couldn't be more than 20. Once you got to 20, you need to divide it into two groups. That, that's the idea. And you basically had one lamb for between 10 and 20 people. Um, and it had to be... Anyway, so it's just perfect. Jesus... And the, um, and the 10 disciples came to meet Peter and John. The other two disciples, you've got 13 people eating, falls right within that range. Um, and, this, they, and they had to set it up. So we don't know whether they went to the grocery store to pick up supplies, whether the man had it, he had the furniture, but it was a furnished upper room um, that, that they went to. And they prepared the meal. And then Jesus arrived in the evening. So notice that he sends them in the morning, and they're preparing during the day. He's got the 10 disciples. Jesus comes with the 10 disciples. Again, Judas doesn't know. So it's in the evening 
they're coming for the dinner and show up right when it's time for dinner. So again, no time for Judas. If he got in there early, Judas could say, oh, I'm going out to, going to use the restroom or whatever he would say to kind of break away. Um, he didn't have that chance because Jesus arrived right when the meal was supposed to start. So Jesus was in control the whole time. Um, so I may have mentioned this last week, but it is, it is important, I think, to understand. Uh, remember, I said that Jesus needed to die when the Passover lambs were being sacrificed. So you need the Passover lambs to be sacrificed before you can have the Passover meal. So how did Jesus eat the Passover meal before the Passover lambs were sacrificed? And there are people who, um, who uh, try to pick the Bible apart and say, see, there's a contradiction, but no, not at all, because we, we've discovered there were so many people coming to Jerusalem. Josephus says around the time of Jesus, about two to two and a half million people um, uh, came in. He knows that because 250,000 lambs, he counted, were sacrificed around that time every year. So you say 10 people at the very low end, you're talking two and a half million people, right? In this small little city of Jerusalem, which at the time I believe was about 80,000 people. So imagine the swelling in size and and, and all the people are there. So they, they very, like many years before, said, this is, we can't do this. You can't sacrifice 250,000 lambs um, and have people to eat all at the same time. So what they did is the people from the northern part of Israel, they celebrated the Passover on Thursday, we would say Thursday night. Um, when the sun set on Thursday night, that was their Passover. And the people from Judea, which is the southern part of Israel, they would... They would go on the official day on the 14th of Nisan and they would do their Passover lamb, uh, a meal. So Jesus, because of this tradition, could eat the Passover meal with the disciples and then be sacrificed or um, killed or murdered on the cross exactly when the Passover lambs also. So there's, you see how it just, it's amazing how all this worked out. So even with tradition, God was working towards this plan um, uh, that Jesus had for the, for the meal. So you have the man's plans. I mentioned covertly arrest and kill Jesus, not during the feast. That's what the priest said. Um, in Luke 22, 6, it says Judas wanted to do this in the absence of crowds. So there's these, these man's plans, the chief priests and the scribes, and Judas had their plans. Now Satan's plans are here as well. Um, Luke 4, 6 says that Satan, remember when Jesus was being tempted in Luke 4, 6, he offered the kingdom without a cross. He said, I'll give you everything that you see right? All that you see here. And um, you have to patch some things together, but we know that the phrase worthy is the lamb. Have you ever thought of why he's worthy and what he's worthy for? And uh, um, biblically, the worthy is the lamb me is, goes to um, Revelation. Remember where there was silence in heaven and there's basically the deed of the earth and said, who is worthy to open the scroll? And nobody was found. And remember, John was just terrified and crying and upset that there was nobody worthy because that meant that Satan would rule this world because nobody could come and take control of this world. And worthy as the lamb is when Jesus appeared, he is worthy because he paid the price. And he's um, holy enough to open that scroll and take the deed of the earth, right? That's sort of the beginning of the revelation. It kind of starts all of that. So he's worthy. Uh, but Satan knew all of this was going to happen. He did not want Jesus to go to the cross. And so he, all along the way, is offering him a way out. So if you would bow the knee to me, I will give you all these kingdoms. In other words, you don't have to go to the cross to get this world. I'll give it to you outside of the cross. And that was a temptation to him. Then in Mark 8, 33, you remember when Jesus made, I mean, when Peter made the great confession, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Remember right after what he said, when Jesus said, oh, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to die and rise again on the third day. Remember what Peter did? He said, no, you're not going to do that. He began to rebuke Jesus. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> right? So the, uh, the belief and my belief is that this is what Satan wanted. He was doing what Satan wanted, which is keep him from the cross. Um, and then I believe Satan, Satan is not om omniscient. In other words, he doesn't know everything, but he's a very smart, powerful being. And he has lived a long time and he's seen what God has said. He was there in the garden when he said that the woman's seed, which is a strange thing to say, the woman's seed will crush your head. You'll bruise his heel, he'll crush your head. And he knew that. And then as God revealed a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, he kept going after God's plan, trying to keep the Messiah from being born and trying to keep Jesus from the cross. He knew the cross was his destruction. 
And so he was trying to keep Jesus from it. So in summary, um, his effort began in the garden and went all the way up to the cross, trying to keep Jesus from the cross. And uh, we can surmise that Satan was trying to keep Jesus from the cross. And Luke 22, 3 tells us Satan entered Judas. Now, why would Satan enter Judas? Because if, it, it, why would he do that? I mean, um, I, I believe the reason why is because he was using what the chief priests thought the crowds would come and rescue Jesus and they wouldn't be able to kill him. So they had to do it quietly. They had to kill him without the crowds knowing, so they're going to do it outside the feast. I believe what Satan was doing is trying to get Jesus arrested so the crowds would save him and he wouldn't go to the cross. I, I think it's that, again, I, don't, I can't read his mind. I don't know his motives. The Bible doesn't say it. But I think it gives us enough clues that I can make an assumption that what he was trying to do is, uh, is trying to work this so that God's timing wouldn't work and that, uh, that the crowds would rescue Jesus and would keep him from the cross. And in a way, Satan would win, or not in a way, Satan would win, so to speak. That's a good question. Hold on to that. I, I promise we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, and Lord willing, we'll touch on it today. Um, because I think this passage is the best place to go to see um, how competing wills work in the Bible. Um, there's a lot of other places that point to it, like uh, uh, Genesis 50, 20, I think it is, where, where Joseph says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That's one place you can go to see how that works. There's a lot of other places you can see, but it's sort of implied here. It's explicit. Jesus explicitly tells us, and we explicitly see in sermons in Acts, in two places, I think it's four and six, where Peter preaches and says, you crucified the son of glory, but God, by God's will, this stuff happened. So there's this both sides of the coin, so to speak. You have what man wants and what God is going to do. And you see this interaction here. And no greater person you see this interaction than in Judas. Because a lot from our standpoint, and I'm saying from our standpoint, not what the Bible says, but from our standpoint, we go, that's not fair. How can God make me do something, this is how I see it, how God can make me do something and then hold me accountable for it. I can't resist God's will, right? You see this? Then there's, God says that I move the heart of the king to get him to do what I want, right? Um, in, in, the, in prophecy, it says that he puts hooks in leaders' mouths and causes them to do what they don't want to do. So, but yet, there's other passages that say that he holds them accountable for what they did. So how can you have both of those things together? And this passage is a great place to go to. Um, it's, let me just say, um, say it this way. If you skip to the end of the Passover meal and look at verse 21, Mark 14, 21, Jesus say, says, I will go as it is written about me. In other words, what's going to happen is gonna happen exactly the way it was written about me. It will be fulfilled this way, right? But, that's an oppositional conjunction, right? It's not and, it's but. So it's, it's in a, opposed to what he just said. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what God said is going to happen, but um, woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. In other words, I'm going to be betrayed according to God's will. It will happen this way, but woe. And woe is a, is, means that person is damned. That person is condemned, but this person is condemned who betrays me. And he goes on to say a very heavy statement. Um, it's better that this man not even been born. It would have been better for him not even been born. Those are very heavy things, but don't lose sight of the fact that he's talking about Judas is doing what he wants, but it's what God wants. Um, and his end is destruction and he's held accountable for it. So God operates, and, and I would love to go more into this, but um, that's not what this passage is about, but it's giving us a sight into that of how do you reconcile these two things. And it's really important, I think, to set aside what I think about it and really just camp on what God says. God says, what is going to happen is what God wills to happen, and the person who causes it to happen is damned, and it'd be better they not even be born. So you say, well, how do you reconcile those two things? And I'll say, from a human's perspective, I cannot. But by faith, I believe what God says. So Judas, does Judas want to be destroyed? Does Judas want to be damned for all eternity? Absolutely not. Um, he's just trying to get out of the situation. Um, he has, 
done really the most heinous thing in the history of the world. You want to see one of the most evil people in the history of the world? I believe it's Judas right here. Um, he sat under the ministry, and he probably has the greatest condemnation of anybody that's ever lived. He sat under the tutelage, and he had offer of repentance again and again and again and again, and he refused it, and he betrayed the very person to offer him the repentance. And so it's a very, very harsh punishment that will come to him. Um, but, so Jesus is going to be killed by God. Um, technically, he gave, gave up the spirit, but, uh, but the cross was God's plan. And when God wanted him to be killed would happen exactly like God planned. So in God's plan, Judas would betray Jesus exactly when God wanted it to happen. But he also was condemned because he betrayed Jesus. Both of those things is true. In my human mind, I want to set that up as it's this, it this, or is it this, right? That's not what God says. God says it is this and it's this. It's an and, not an or. And that is hard from my human fairness, because we all have these fairness meters. Well, that's not fair and that's not right. But I would uh, point you to passages where we start telling God what is right and what is wrong, uh, where Paul would say, who are you <laughs> to talk back to God who is in charge? And so I would just uh, commend that to you. So God's plan would be fulfilled through Judas' betrayal, and God would use Judas to act to fulfill his plan, yet Judas would not be held innocent. Um, and I got this, this quote, um, because really, this is true of any sinner who rejects God. It would be better that that person had not been born. When you look at their ultimate end, um, if they're going to reject the offer what they're going to get for all eternity be better they not even be born. God will gain glory from you either in life or in death. Um, better to bow the knee and give him glory in life and gain life rather than to refuse to bow and get it in death. So I have this phrase, God, uh, this is from a commentary. It says, God uses every person who rejects him to accomplish his own purpose and his own plan and none will be exonerated because our sovereign God overrules for his own ends and his own glory, their own choices. And if you'd say, well, I don't agree with that, I would just leave you with this question before we wrap up on the Passover meal. Do you believe anyone can thwart the purposes of God by acting against Christ, his church, the gospel, and God himself? And I think all of us will say no. So if that's true, the logical outwork is you cannot thwart what God wills happen, right? Um, anyway, why was the Passover meal? Um, just to maybe... Uh, I know some people have to leave. I'm just going to go maybe 10 more minutes. I just want to talk about the importance of this Passover meal. Oh, it's okay. The importance of this Passover meal. Luke records Jesus as saying, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before my suffering. And literally the Greek reads, with desire, I have desired um, this Passover to eat with you. And when you say something twice, that's like us in our language adding mega super or something in front of the word. Uh, to amplify the importance of something. So when you say, I have desired with great desire to do something, you're saying the desire is that key point and it's very deep, more than just a simple desire. And the word epithemia means a strong eagerness or a passion. We get this word passion. Um, this meal would begin around 6 p.m., last till midnight. And during this time period, some, some um, kingdom founding truths were passed on. Um, I just looked at the six-hour window. Here's some of the things that happened, just looking at John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, there's the Passover meal. The betrayer was pointed out and left. Satan's action is described. The confrontation with Peter happens. You know, you will deny me three times. The common thing of the disciples arise. Uh, we're going to smile when, you, when I say this. Uh, who's the greatest? <laughs> it's a common theme from the disciples, but Jesus deals with this. Um, and he deals with it by an example of the feet washing. Um, the teaching from John 13 through 16. So if you read John 13 and 16, that is the, the teaching that happens. It's, you might say, the last words before Jesus dies. It's the last words of teaching to his disciples. Uh, of course, I know he raises again, but this is the last, the last teaching he has before he goes to the cross. And in it, you get the Holy Spirit promise, the Holy Spirit's ministry explained. Persecution is coming, fellowship, how to have fellowship with the Father, and much, much more in that passage. And then one of the, I think of the holy of holy, one of the holiest places in all of Scripture is John 17, where Jesus prays to God for us. And you ever wonder, well, how Jesus prays to God right now for us? You can read John 17 and see how how Jesus. I think that is a window into what Jesus is doing right now as I speak. I was interceding, always interceding for us. And then there's warnings. And then lastly, why this is important. 
is really you're looking at the convergence of the Old Testament and the New Testament right here in this meal. You might say, when does the Old Testament end and the New Testament begins? I don't know there's an exact place, but here there's overlap. Because, and, and um, anybody know what testament means? Where we get our phrases, testament, Old Testament, New Testament? Is it like a declaration? Or? Covenant. It covenant. Yeah, it's Old Covenant, New Covenant. That's why the Jews don't call it the Old Covenant. <laughs> it's, it's the scriptures. It's not the old scriptures. It's, the, it's their scriptures. To us, we have a new covenant. And this is the meal where he establishes the new covenant. Um, and, and the new covenant is uh, all covenants scripturally and in, the, in, in this time was uh, um, signed by blood, so to speak. There was a sacrifice. And uh, what's interesting here is he's remembering forward because he's saying, do this in remembrance of me, but we're supposed to remember him for it hasn't happened yet. That's tomorrow. <laughs> but he's saying, do this in remembrance of me. We do it in remembrance, but when they were eating it, it was a look back and a look forward kind of thing, right? They're looking back, this Passover meal, they're looking back to the Passover, the escape from Egypt, but they're all, Jesus is telling them, look forward and remember me for what's going to happen tomorrow. Now they didn't know, but he's setting this. And afterwards, I, I wonder what they thought when they thought back to what he's saying, remember me, do this in remembrance of me. Um, there were, I don't have time to go through this, but there are very specific times that they, he did this and uh, we can kind of guess where he washed the feet, where he uh, drank the cup, where he established. And it's believed on the third cup, there's four cups and on the third cup, which I believe is called the cup of blessing. I can't remember exactly, but, um, but when he took that cup, that's the one he said, I will not drink this again until we're in the kingdom. Now, um, Notice that we, we look back a lot. When we do take communion, we think of remember what Christ has done for us. But I really want to call out, we all know that, but I want to call out there's a future piece too. Mm -hmm. So just like the disciples were looking back to the Passover and looking forward to the cross, we look back to the cross and look forward to the future. And say, well, how are we looking forward to the future? Well, if you go to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two. by the way, if you want to win a trivia uh, uh, Bible trivia, the first words of Jesus that were ever recorded are found in 1 Corinthians, because 1 Corinthians is written before the Gospels. And in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, Jesus said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we stop that, and people say, do this in remembrance of me, but he says, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And here in, in Mark, it says, um, uh, we didn't, we didn't read into that, but in verse um, 25, truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day, what day? When I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So there will someday be a Passover meal that we'll participate in with Jesus Christ. And he's not gonna drink this cup until that comes true. If you wanna chase that down and say, well, I've never heard that before. Look at Ezekiel, I think it's 45 through 48. Um, Specifically in Ezekiel um, 45, 21 through 25, you can read of how this Passover will be celebrated. Um, there will be temple, there'll be a temple in place. In the, in the millennial reign, I believe is when it happens, there'll be animal sacrifices and a seven day feast, just like this feast of the Passover. Um, and he tells us that he will not drink it again until he does this in the new kingdom. So next, next time we take communion, meditate on that. We're looking back to the cross um, and we're looking forward to th someday, we're not only taking this to remember him, we're proclaiming his death to those around, who you, when you proclaim something, it's to other people around you, right? When you're taking that, you're telling people, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins and I partake and I have fellowship with him by drinking this cup and eating this bread. You're proclaiming his death to those around us. That is, that is in essence, that's a piece of the gospel. I'm telling people this really happened and I remember it, and it was really important. But we we're also doing it till the day that he comes, we're looking forward, someday we'll eat with him. And at that time, I think we'll be looking back to the cross. It'll be a remembrance of what Christ did for us at the cross through the sacrifices, and we'll be celebrating the Passover. But it's not really the, the, uh, um, the, the shadow of the real Passover, it's the real Passover that happened at the cross. So it's a beautiful thing. So in conclusion, um, verses one through 25 here, we see God providentially shepherding all events um, towards a specific event, which was the cross. Uh, we see men and Satan had different plans. Um, and even, even the disciples really had a different plan, right? They didn't understand what was going on. They thought the kingdom was coming. Is the kingdom coming now? Is the kingdom coming now? They were arguing about who's gonna be greatest in the kingdom. 
So really nobody around except for Jesus really knew what was going to happen. They had different plans in their mind. But just like it says in Proverbs, men make plans, but God directs their steps. So they all had plans, but God is directing their steps. They think they're going where they want to go, but they're going where God wants them. Um, so we see the understanding and the sacrificial worship of Mary and the meal with, uh, with Simon in, the, in this passage. We see divine control Jesus had over every situation. He told Judas when he could leave at the precise time, and he knew when Judas would find him, which would be in the Garden of Gethsemane. So everything is happening according to God's plan. In contrary to what man wanted, what Judas, what the priest wanted, what Judas wanted, what Satan wanted, God's will would be done. Um, so we see the intimate dinner with the 11 remaining disciples and the establishment of remembrance for what Jesus was about to do. And we still celebrate the same remembrance that Jesus established. We call it one of the, the two ordinances. Some people say there are three, that foot washing is an ordinance. I don't think so. I think it's the, the Lord's table. We might say the... the have you ever, has anybody ever gone to a church where uh, the table and they, and they pass it around, but all of the... Uh, communion sits on the table and remember what that table says usually do this remembrance. remembrance yeah do this in remembrance of me it has that and that's exactly that's what jesus said do this in remembrance of me remembrance of what i'm about ready to do lastly we see a promise that jesus would once again celebrate this passover meal with his disciples and i believe with us so each person that's sitting in this room right now someday will be taking that cup of wine we be taking that piece of bread and we'll be celebrating it in the new kingdom with jesus christ Imagine what that's going to be like. It's for seven days. You ever been to a feast for seven days? Yeah. I suspect this is the marriage supper of the Lamb, but that's, that's a different thing. So their remembrance was backwards looking, Passover Lamb in Egypt, and forward looking, future fellowship with Jesus. But our remembrance is backwards looking as well to the cross and forward looking to the future fellowship with Jesus. So over, over all of this, there's so much stuff, and it was really hard to decide what to talk about here. But... But I would say the one thing that really stood out to me as I studied it this time through was God's providence over everything. The timing, working against the will of people that wanted to do different things, and it happened exactly. When you think about it, Jesus was crucified on the cross. Satan didn't want him there. The priest didn't want him there. Judas was so mortified that he committed suicide, right? and he killed himself. Um, and uh, really, it's only God that wanted that to happen exactly when it happened. Um, and it happened just like he said it was happening. So you see God's providential work. And, and I use that word a very technical. I mean, uh, sovereignty is God can do whatever he wants. Uh, he has the power to do what he wants. Providence is whatever he does, it works for our good, works for good. And so this is providence for you, for each one of us. This is providence for you. This happened, and we now have the blessing of all that teaching that happened during those six hours. We see the example of humility, of what greatness looks like in the kingdom by Christ washing the disciples' feet. He had taught them. Three or four times in Mark, it came up where they were arguing about, and Jesus taught them. But here, he not only taught them, but he taught them through actions, by washing their feet. It's the only time when he teaches and shows them what it looks like. And we have that example. Uh, so that's a blessing, a blessing for us during this time. Any other comments on that or anything that you think I missed? I want to say before we pray. Sovereignty falls underneath providence. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty to me is the is the big circle, and providence. Really, it's hard to say there's a smaller circle because sovereignty and providence to me are the same thing. Sovereignty just describes his power to do it. Providence gives me a reason why he does it. He works all I mean, things for good. When you talk today and what we learned before. Yeah. Providence, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man are parallel truths that run both parallel. Right. And can we fully understand? No, I don't think God intended for us to fully understand, them, but they're both there. Yeah. And just as you talk about uh, how Nicodemus, to pray, not Nicodemus, but when Christ is talking to Nicodemus in that chapter in John, right. the first four or five verses, I remember the number of verses, deal with the sovereignty of God and then the, uh, the, the free will of man. Yep. Jesus deals with both of them in the same chapter. And the Apostle Paul uh, talks about uh, the new Christians in, in chapter 4, he talked about two Christians don't give place to the devil. But in the very next chapter, he says, you know, surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit. So it could be that Satan 
and the Holy Spirit both lead toward their direction to what they both stand for. If that's the right way to say it. Yeah, yeah. It's so I, I. Uh... The challenge, I think, is for us not to put what we think it means on top of Scripture because we don't have the perspective to answer that question. You've heard the, I think it's an old Indian proverb of the four or five blind men that come up to the elephant and they feel parts of the elephant and they try to describe what it is. And they one person feels the, yeah. the, 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 the leg and says, oh, it's a tree. And the other person feels this is a no, it's this, it's this. And, and it, that's what I feel like we do when we take what we see or what we want to see in Scripture and we layer it on top and say, that's what it says. But I think we just need to set aside that and see what God says. And what God clearly says. And, and you can go to this passage to study it and see if what I'm saying is not true. But um, Both those parallel truths we see in Romans 7 with Paul. Yeah. Well, I need to... Go ahead. Yeah, I gotta go. Um, just that I appreciate you teaching on the... Last Supper, I always kind of thought, I think of the new covenant being established as crucifixion. Yes. But just the importance of the Last Supper being established there, not That's right. his death on the cross, but through the Last Supper. Yeah, because he says, this is my blood given for the new covenant. Right. Well, his blood hadn't been given yet. It's a, it's a, um, a future prophetic, like... In the Old Testament, many times they'll say this is going to happen, but they'll speak as if it's it's called prophetic future, meaning it's already they'll speak of like it's already happened, because it's so sure God is so in control. He says it's already happened, just like in in Romans eight it says we have been glorified. Now, if you know me, you know I've not been glorified, and if I know you, you've not been glorified yet. That's how it speaks about us. We have been glorified from God's perspective. It's as if we are already glorified, because it will happen. That's so sure. So anyway, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these truths, these words, very deep, deep waters here when it comes to your will and, and our will and how all that works together. But we see it in this, uh, the most important event in the history of the world, the, your son at the cross that established a new covenant, the blood of the new covenant. We see today how the, it was established a, a day before it, uh, it actually happened or a few hours before it actually happened, and we do this in remembrance. We now, when we take it, we do it in remembrance of you. We pray this would just stick with us. We would think about this. We meditate on it. We would just feel thankful of all the work that you've done for us, all your providence, how it's worked to our good and to your son's glory. We pray that uh, your son would gain glory from this as we meditate on this, and it would change the way we live, change the way we act, and give us a, a right perspective on this world. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.